Hello, Chem 122. This is Professor James Ormord, and today we're going to talk about experiment number 28, Organic Functional Groups. All right, let's go ahead and take a look. All right, let's go ahead and uh, take a look here at these uh, organic chemistry functional groups. Um, you guys are, are going to have to learn all these different functional groups. Uh, as you guys can probably see, they all contain either carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, or nitrogen. And as you explore organic chemistry next semester, you'll see that uh, the majority of the chemistry is governed by the way that these specific atoms are bonded together. Uh, not so much necessarily uh, what specific elements there are, but we look at functional groups uh, more often than not in organic chemistry. And then here I have a little bit of a joke. It's the organic chemistry <laughs> periodic table. As you can see that we don't actually uh, use a lot of the elements on the periodic table. It's most likely going to be carbon, ni carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, hydrogen, and the halogens. And then we do have these outliers that are involved in specific reactions. Uh, the goal of this experiment is to go through all the main groups of functional groups and we're going to get a little survey of the entire year of organic chemistry. Uh, I'm going to uh, talk the detail a little bit of the organic reactions and don't worry too much if you're not understanding everything in its full detail. Uh, the main takeaway from this lab is that you're learning your functional groups and that your, uh, your observations are being put to good use. Okay, uh, the first experiment we're going to be doing is we're going to take a look at the solubility of alkanes. Uh, recall from the chart that alkanes are simply carbon-carbon single bonds, uh, no double bonds, no oxygens, nothing like that. Uh, these things are generally uninteresting in organic chemistry. They don't react very readily. Uh, they, however, do make really good solvents and they burn very well. So <laughs> we're going to be doing that in today's lab. So uh, solubility here. Uh, we, uh, we see the word miscibility here. Uh, miscibility is specifically referring to two liquids mixing together. Okay, uh, so we're going to take some uh, hexane and then we're going to add some water to it and see what happens. So uh, what we should expect to see for things that are uh, soluble or miscible with each other is the liquids mixed together. And then if you get a biphasic mixture, that means they're not mixing and they're immiscible then. Okay. We are going to do a series of solubility tests. We're going to test the solubility versus water and hexane. And I wanted to make sure that everyone has a clear picture of what inmiscible or insoluble is versus what is soluble. So we're going to try to show these two side by side. Okay. So this solvent on my, on your right, my left, is water. This solvent's hexane. We're going to add cyclohexane to both of them. And first of all, I will show you water. So where's the test tube? Okay. And I'm just going to add a big squirt. And let's see if it looks towel. better with the towel. Yeah, that's good. It almost looks better with dark, with my hand. Okay. You see, no two matter layers. how hard I shake it, there is always two layers. I'll shake it again. It immediately separates into two layers. This is a good example of a polar and a nonpolar. They do not mix, so they're completely immiscible. I'm going to put this one in this test tube. Then we're going to do cyclohexane into hexane. So this is nonpolar into nonpolar. And you should have saw right away that there was no line of separation. So side-by-side -side comparisons, one has a definite line. Use the paper towel too. I'm gonna to try the paper towel. You can see it pretty good there. You can see it pretty well. Yeah. And one of them is yeah. completely miscible. So we're gonna Okay, uh, the next text we're gonna look at is the combustibility of alkanes. Uh, here we're going to be uh, taking some test tubes and uh, doing something we shouldn't be doing in an organic lab is lighting a Bunsen burner. You guys will see next year we don't use the Bunsen burner even one time the, in, during the entire year of organic chemistry. Uh, so we're going to be uh, taking some Bunsen burners, lighting them, and adjusting the flame to different uh, oxygen amounts. So if you have an orangish flame, recall that that is not complete combustion. And what we should expect to see... Uh, with an incomplete combustion here is you should see the formation of carbon soot, uh, elemental carbon, on the test tube. 
Uh, in the case where the oxygen or the sorry the flame has a bright blue flame, that is complete combustion, and you, you should see complete conversion of carbon dioxide. Okay, we're taking a test tube. We turn the oxygen to minimum on the Bunsen burner, and we're going to hold this in the flame, the end of it for at least 60 seconds. And we're doing the reaction now of methane with uh, very little oxygen. And I always tell my students that the products, we'll see in a second, is that the methane gas will still convert the hydrogen into water, but there's not enough oxygen to convert the carbon into carbon dioxide. Instead, it'll make, it'll make soot. Okay, so, all right, it's been about, I don't know how many seconds, but we want to look at this test tube now against a white backdrop, and I'll just hold it up here. It looks see it pretty good. Yeah. You can see it yeah. against the back here. Yeah, bring it, bring it close to the camera, please. You see how the end of the test tube is covered with actually carbon? We call it sit. Now I'm going to do one more test tube the exact same way. So we can have side by side comparisons. Okay, so we'll now do another 60 seconds on the second test tube. All right. Been about 60 seconds, and you'll see we have a second test tube. It has a lovely dark soot coating as well. So to do the side by side now, we're going to take this one. And we're going to change the oxygen intake on the on our Bunsen burner to make the methane turn into a bright blue flame. All right, can we see that on the Bunsen burner? Cut the light for a second. There we go. That's better. Okay. Now you see that lovely blue flame? Yeah. You see it? Yeah. Okay. It what we're going to do is we're going to take that second test tube, put it on the end of the flame, and make it glow nice and yellow for about a minute as well. There we go. You see the lovely glowing color. And now we've added excess oxygen, so we'll be able to compare the two test tubes side by side. Go ahead, turn the light on. So this was the one that originally looked like the second one. You guys see that? We'll hold that nice and close. So the bottom one is limited of oxygen, that makes carbon soot. The top one, the carbon all turned into carbon dioxide and you don't see as much soot. Okay, for the uh, next experiment, we are going to be taking a look at alkenes for this part. Uh, recall that alkenes are compounds that contain a carbon-carbon double bond. Specifically, they must have a carbon-carbon double bond and be considered an alkene. Uh, so we're going to be testing for a different addition reaction. So the first reaction we're going to be doing here is the reaction with bromine. Uh, it turns, let's take a look at the next slide here. So uh, here uh, you get an idea of the difference between organic chemistry and general chemistry in that we tend to want to follow the way atoms move, it's specifically how reactions work, they're nuts and bolts on how reactions work. And uh, the main takeaway from this test here is your bromine is a orange-brown color. And if it, if it is reacting, it'll, it'll add to the alkene and the color will go away because this is a... Uh, does it have, this comment does not have color where the bromine doesn't. So once again, we're going to be starting with a orange-brown color that disappears as a positive test. I did want to point out here there are different ways that we talk about addition reactions in organic chemistry, and it's mainly the way that the groups add across the double bond. So these are adding on the opposite faces of this compound here, so we say this is an anti-addition. And then you may have learned this word here, enantiomer. You should have learned this recently, probably in the chordation compounds chapter. Uh, what that word means is that this compound is handed. So you would have the other hand version of this molecule as another product.
Okay. So for the ne next portion here, we're going to be testing for unsaturation, carbon-carbon double bonds. So here I have cyclohexane. This is an alkane. There are no double bonds. It should be negative towards this test. And then here we have cyclohexene, which should be positive. And then for the first test here, we're going to be using bromine. So uh, bromine naturally has a dark uh, orange-brown color. And then a positive is the color going away. A negative is the color persisting. So let's go ahead and take a look here first. Cyclohexane should be negative, so we should be expecting the color to stay. Let's see. I only need about one drop. Yep, yep. color persists. That is a negative. Good thing I have paper towels down. <laughs> All right, cyclohexene, let's go ahead and take a look. You see the color uh, disappears as soon as it touches the liquid. Yep, I'm actually dropping quite a bit in there. Color goes away, that is positive. All right. And just for fun, let's see what happens when I pour this one into this one. that the color kind of goes away. All right. Uh, the next reaction we're going to be doing here is the test for oxidation of alkenes with potassium permanganate. Uh, as we've seen previous this semester, uh, potassium permanganate is a really strong oxidizer and does readily uh, oxidize oxidizable carbons. And it turns out that alkene carbons are oxidizable. Uh, so here we have a general overview of the mechanism. Uh, the mechanisms are the nuts and bolts on how reactions work, and these arrows here are indicating electron motion. Uh, notice the wording here saying syn addition. Uh, this large molecule adds to the same face of the molecule, and then going through all this here, I'm not going to go through all the detail here, I just wanted to show it to you, give you an idea of what organic chemistry is about. Uh, but the main takeaway here is that these are adding in the same face, meaning it's a syn addition versus an anti-addition. So anti-addition is opposite face, syn addition is same face. Uh, what we should expect to see in the lab for this particular experiment is the potassium permanganate is a purple color. And after it reacts, it's not showing it here, but it becomes MnO2, which is a brown precipitate. So the formation of a brown color is a positive for the permanganate test. Okay, now we're going to do the second test for unsaturation. This time we're going to be using uh, potassium permanganate. And as you guys should have seen early, earlier this semester, uh, potassium permanganate is a really strong oxidizer. And it, it'll uh, become MnO2, which is a brownish color. So the appearance of a brown color is a positive with this test. So uh, cyclohexane should be negative. Let's go ahead and take a look. I'm going to add a, just a drop or two. And we should see the purple color persisting. Yep. It's biphasic because this is organic. They, you know, oil and water don't mix. But we do see the purple color staying. That is a negative towards this test. The next one here is the uh, wonderful smelling cyclohexene. Note the sarcasm there. Stuff smells really bad, actually. And we should see brown color appearing. Yep, I'm seeing a little on the bottom there. Let me get a little bit more just so it's a little bit more obvious. There we go. Yeah, I'm seeing the discoloration. Let me hold them side by side. It'll be really obvious then. Let me get a paper towel. So this was cyclohexane. And then this one was cyclohexene. So the brown color there is a positive. All right. OK, uh, for the next portion of the experiment, we're going to be looking at the solubility, miscibility of different alcohols in polar and nonpolar solvents. Uh, one general rule for alcohol solubility in water is that it's typically considered to be soluble if there are less than or equal to three carbons, sorry, uh, three carbons per OH. So the lower the carbon count is per OH you have, the more soluble it is. So for example, I would expect a three carbon alcohol to be soluble where a seven carbon alcohol should be insoluble in water. 
So we're going to be taking a couple different alcohols here, uh, ethanol, propanol, and then we have this 2-methyl, two 2-propanol. Two you should have learned your alkane nomenclature a little bit in your lecture. Um, we should see a difference in solubility in water. Uh, you're then going to repeat the experiments with hexane, which is a 6-carbon alkane. It is completely in, uh, sorry, nonpolar, uh, so we should see some interesting differences here. So one solvent is polar, water is polar, and then our nonpolar solvent is hexane, and then dissolving different alcohols in them and seeing where they go. Um, we are going to do the same now on a smaller scale with alcohols. So first we're going to put a little bit of hexane in one, a little bit of water, then we'll add the alcohol. So we're just going to do a small scale. A little bit of hexane, enough to see a layer. Just need about a centimeter and a little bit of water, enough to see a layer there. And the first alcohol that we're going to try is ethyl alcohol. So we'll put these two up front. Ethyl alcohol and I almost want a black backdrop. I'm going to hold it right here. We're going to add a couple squirts in the water and ethyl alcohol. You see two layers? I got it. The black backdrop's working really well. And that one, as you can tell, what kind of layers are there? Now we have the hexane and ethyl alcohol. And we're going to shake that together. Now an interesting thing about polarity, if you're soluble in both, we like to say those molecules are bipolar. In other words, they can't decide if they're polar or nonpolar, they're some of both. So those are the ethanol. We're going to do the same thing now with the rubbing alcohol, also known as isopropyl alcohol, or in your book it's called 2-propanol. So a little bit of hexane. in the one, a little bit of water in the other one. Let's bring out the 2-propanol. Uh, again, this is more commonly known as rubbing alcohol. We'll hold it up. We'll add the drops. You see I had a significant amount. Shake vigorously and you see the layers. Now again, I'm going to put this one as a comparison of immiscible versus this one. So that's water. Do the same thing with the hexane. Shake them up. Looking for two layers. Okay. So that takes care of the isopropyl alcohol. Do the same thing with tert-butyl alcohol, also known as two methyl 2-propanol, that's this one, 2-methyl 2-propanol. Okay, first we've got to put a little solvent in, so water, about a centimeter, hexane, about a centimeter, and then we'll add a squirt to each. So, 2-methyl 2-propanol. Now this one, hopefully I added enough you nope we're not seeing it right around four carbons is the breaking point between solubility and water or not this one 2-methyl 2-propanol has exactly four carbons and so usually they say it's mostly soluble but somewhat insoluble I'm going to see if I can exceed the water limit probably <laughs> not because it's still looking soluble um, if we went to five and six carbons, it'll become more and more like this one that's completely insoluble. So that's a general rule for alcohols. Right around four carbons is about the maximum you can dissolve per alcohol. Let's see what happens in hexane. Again, we're going to add, oh, this is hexane. We forgot to add the alcohol. Where is the alcohol? I already put the 
Okay, so we squirt the alcohol in, and one of the things that's a general rule for alcohols is the more carbons, the more it dissolves in organic solvents. So, um, this one and this one, we'll hold them up higher and together. Okay, so that ends the solubility test for the alcohols. Okay, uh, the next one we're going to be doing with the alcohols here is we're going to be doing a substitution reaction of phenols. Uh, so we're actually going to be running the reaction with bromine, uh, similar to what we did with the alkenes. Uh, the main difference here is uh, we actually get a substitution reaction happening with bromine and not an addition reaction like we saw with the alkenes. I'm not going to go over the reason why. We have a whole chapter dedicated to that reason why in organic chemistry too. But I did want to give you just a little overview of what what it's about. All right, so here we're seeing the general reaction mechanism of how bromine, uh, Br plus would be the case here, would react with a benzene ring. Uh, it turns out that we actually need a catalyst, an iron three bromide catalyst to make bromine turn into a Br plus like compound, and then it can react. Uh, in general, aromatic compounds are fairly unreactive. Uh, however, uh, we can get them to react with a catalyst. It turns out though, however, that the, the presence of an OH group on here, like a phenol, uh, makes these benzene rings very reactive and then we no longer need the catalyst. So the reaction works in the lab without a catalyst and we should observe that in today's experiment. Uh, we do revisit energy diagrams in organic chemistry. Uh, here is the energy diagram uh, illustrating that we have a very large energy of activation for the formation of the intermediate. Uh, thus, the reason for the catalyst here. But remember that if we have an OH here, this energy of activation is much lower because the benzene is more reactive. So we don't actually need the catalyst here for the phenol reaction to work. Uh, what we're going to be looking for in the, our observations are disappearance of the color as well as the formation of HBr, which we can test for. There's a breath test here that doesn't quite work all the time. But um, we can either use litmus paper also to test for this. Okay, we're now going to do a test of phenol and its electrophilic aromatic substitution properties. I um, wanted to show you these lovely crystals of pure phenol. This is, comes from the container where they were gradually subliming off the bottom and recrystallizing on top. And phenol makes these lovely spindles almost of a hexagon type shape. Let me see. Yeah. So um, that's the pure phenol or these crystals up here. We've taken some of the phenol and we created a saturated solution in water. Um, as much phenol as we can. You see it's kind of got a hazy tint. The key in the bromine test, there's two parts. We're going to test to see um, first can phenol decolorize bromine and that is can the red color go away and then we're looking for a substitution which means we're going to be looking to see if we can if phenol is extruding HBr. So we have our litmus paper test here. The catch, make sure you don't drip any of the bromine on the edges near the top. So I'm going to take this lovely dark red liquid and you can see even though I squirted it in like on the previous experiment the color of the dark red immediately decolorizes and I've now added enough drops that we can hopefully now test I'm going to shake vigorously and test for hydrogen bromide. We need some moist litmus paper Set it across the top and let it sit for a second. Can we see the color? Okay, so in litmus paper, as we, we talked about in previous labs, if blue turns red, that's the presence of an acid. And we're trying to see if we can capture hydrogen bromide by it floating up to the top, mixing with the water, and turning into hydrobromic acid. Um, we're just going to let this sit for a second. And uh, I also wanted to make a comment about 
the bottom down here. One of the things about phenol is that when it brominates, it'll brominate three times and it'll eventually make a white solid precipitate. But we're not getting much of the HBR to come out. Yeah, this is why. Okay, I'm going to add, I'm going to hold this to the side just for a second and add some more bromine. Try to excess it. The color is still going away on the bromine. Let's see if we can capture some of the HBR. I'm afraid of holding it inside. See, my hands are slightly acidic. Let's just stick this down inside and see what happens. Still not seeing it. Yeah, we'll just let it sit. Oh, uh, yeah, the edges are starting to turn. And so the evidence of the blue turning pink is evidence of making hydrogen bromide gas. <laughs> I didn't mean to do that. I stuck it right into the water solution. It turned completely pink. So we made a lot of hydrobromic acid that gets stuck in the water. I'm going to try the fog test now while this is all sitting there. It said in the procedures to breathe in it and look for fogging. and I never see it work. <laughs> yep. So anyway, the better test is that the red, the litmus taper turning so red so quickly is good evidence. Okay, cut. Uh, we're going to be uh, then running uh, the more reacting with alcohols. Which I mentioned earlier today that uh, oxidizable carbons uh, can be oxidized by, by potassium permanganate. It works out that primary and secondary alcohols are oxidizable by permanganate. And what we're going to be doing here is looking for the presence of a brown color being positive. If the purple color persists, it is negative. Uh, here I'm showing a stepwise oxidation of our alcohol. It turns out that alcohol will fully oxidize to carboxylic acids. Uh, the way that we approach oxidation and reduction in organic chemistry is a little bit different than what we saw in uh, general chemistry. Uh, specifically in organic chemistry, we look at the number of bonds uh, to oxygen from a carbon. So here in the starting compound, we see that this carbon has one bond to oxygen, and then our final product has three bonds to different oxygens. That is an oxidation. And then the intermediate here had two bonds to oxygen compared to the starting one. So first oxidation, second oxidation. Turns out permanganate does this very readily. It's a strong oxidizer. It works very fast. Okay, we're now going to test for the oxidative properties of alcohols using permanganate. Uh, we're going to first start with ethyl alcohol. I already added a small sample, so now I need to add about four or five drops of the permanganate. One, two, three, four. And what we're waiting to see is how long does it take to change its color. And you remember permanganate starts off purple when it's at a plus seven. When it goes to a positive four, it turns brown. And if it goes all the way to positive two, it's practically colorless. It's a very, very pale pink. Okay, so now we're gonna do some rubbing alcohol. Same thing. One, two, three, four. Shake it up. See how fast that one changed? We have some turbutyl alcohol already in here. It has a bad habit of freezing at around room temperature. We're going to add five, four drops to this one. One, two, three, four. Shake it up. Wait for that one. And lastly, we're going to do benzyl alcohol. We have a small sample of benzyl alcohol. We're going to add the four drops. One, two, three, four. 
shake it up and see how fast that one changed and it, it looked like it, I didn't add any so I'm gonna add another two drops one, come on drop or drop one I think there's something plugging our dropper. We get plugged. Got some magnets. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely plugged. Okay, we at least we got five drops in there, and you'll see the lovely color change that happened with the benzyl alcohol. So, after about uh, we've been going now for a, about a minute and a half, and you can see which ones changed and how far they changed and how quickly they changed. Okay, uh, the next here we're going to be uh, taking a look at some of the chemistry of aldehyde and ketones. Uh, these are car compounds that have carbon double bond O bonds. And we're going to be doing the very classic Tollens test or reaction with the monocle silver nitrate. Uh, in the lab here we actually make this solution uh, we actually make it a little bit different than the procedure says. Typically, the way I typically make this stuff is I will take still some, some silver nitrate and I'll add uh, concentrated ammonia dropwise until the precipitate appears and then it just goes away. And then I'll add a little bit of hydroxide to it to make it more alkaline. And then I will, that'll make a black precipitate. And then I will add concentrated ammonia dropwise until the precipitate just disappears. And then you have your active ingredient for an oxidation reaction. So uh, here's the general overall scheme on what we're making here. So uh, silver nitrate and hydroxide can form silver oxide. I mentioned a black precipitate, that is silver oxide. And then it turns out that if you have ammonia around, it'll make this complex ion that is actually our active ingredient. Shown in the reaction here is an Ag+. And any aldehydes will oxidize into a carboxylic acid. Uh, this is commonly referred to as the silver mirror test or the Tollens test. And notice here we're seeing metallic silver as our product. We are going to do the Tollens test, which is a test to distinguish the differences between aldehydes and ketones. All the sugars in nature on the planet are either an aldehyde or ketone. So your conclusion is we're going to test glucose, the most common of all the sugars to see whether glucose is an aldo sugar or a keto sugar. So to do that first we got to make the Tollens reagent. We need about 20 milliliters so we're going to pour out about 20 milliliters of the silver nitrate and we have a nice colorless solution that's good. Then we're going to add about 5 milliliters of sodium hydroxide the amounts don't matter but you will see when as soon as we add this it turns to a nice dark black color there we go and now the secret to making the Tollens reagent work really well is add just enough concentrated ammonia so all this dark precipitate completely dissolves now I gotta hold my breath on this part so we'll just squirt it in ah. Okay, guys, no breathing over here. You need smell a vision. <laughs> breathing concentrated ammonia is a nice way to wake up in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> it was used in the old days as smelling salts to help fainted ladies recover. Okay. That looks about like enough. I can. Let's just do one more swirl. And if we look closely, all the precipitate has redissolved. I'm going to add just a drop more. There's a little speck on the bottom. And close this lid. And we get it far from me. <laughs> okay, we're done breathing the ammonia. We have a nice Tollens reagent here. So now we can put about a fourth of it into each test tube. Again, the, since this is a visual, we don't need an exact amount. We just need some Tollens reagent into each before we add our aldehyde or our ketone. 
Okay, so we have some tollens into each. Um, our first test reagent is going to be some acetaldehyde. We just need to add one squirt. Whoa, and this stuff also smells really good. Acetaldehyde, if you read the uh, labels, is a lacrimer, which is a fancy word for helping people to cry. So we're going to do this one really fast. We're going to add one squirt. Well, it came right out. There we go. Right into this test tube. And you see it's already starting to react. And being an aldehyde, if it reacts positively, you'll see that it makes a dark silver like sheen all around. And we have a lovely positive aldehyde test. Bring it closer to the it's not quite silver shiny, but you'll see there's some reflections of silver. Can you see that? You can see it on that side? Okay. Yeah, we're actually making a coating of silver metal right on the surface of the glass. And that's classic of the Tollens test called the silver mirror. So we'll set this one aside. And now, and move the acetaldehyde out of the way. We're going to now do the same thing with acetone. Acetone, as you know, should be a ketone. So we're going to add a, just a little squirt. We're getting to precipitate with acetone. What the? That is a bad result. Oh, it better go away. It's not supposed to do anything. <laughs> Make it too basic, maybe? Yeah, possibly. But it's not making the silver mirror. Okay, so we're going to say this is a negative test. Um, I'm going to try it again on another test tube in just a second. Um, I do have some leftover silver nitrate. But we want to finish our test, so um, can you have me four of those? Uh, Test no, Erlenmeyer flask. The little ones? The mediums. Yeah. Okay, we're going to do benzaldehyde. Yeah, I want to just set them up. So this one, the nice, the bigger one. <laughs> bigger one? Yeah, the mediums. Sorry. This side? Yep, that'll work. Okay, I want to leave these in order. So the acetaldehyde, lovely, um, nice solid precipitate. The acetone it looks like we got a little side reaction going on, but it should have been negative because it's a ketone. Benzaldehyde often has a hard time mixing with the reagent. As you can see, it went right to the bottom and clumped up. Everybody see that? So we're going to do two things. We're going to shake vigorously. and see if we can force a silver mirror out of this. And all that I did Yeah, or cherry cough syrup. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it reminds me of when you smell it. Okay, so the benzaldehyde, I'm gonna bring it up close. You'll see that it, um, it's starting to make also a silver coating. It made a lovely dark precipitate. I'm going to do that now. Because we are starting to get a nice silver. Yeah. Okay. So we'll put that one in that. Erlenmeyer, so we'll have them all stacked up here. Okay, and the last one is sugar, glucose. We just need to make a small sample in our fourth and final test tube. Uh, usually you mix glucose with a little bit of water, but we're, we have plenty of aqueous solution in here. A scoop in. I might need a scoop if I can't get it in. Hang on. Oh. I got enough. You got it? 
Yep, let's see how it works. Okay, the glucose is now sitting on the bottom. Sure, this is glucose. <laughs> <laughs> Usually it goes yellow first and then, and then the it, plating. Yeah. Well, you usually you only have to heat it for a second. So I heated it for a second. Oh my gosh, that's such a difference. Turn, turn the test tube, you can see the silver, I think. Yeah, the very bottom, it's, it's really silver. And the sides are turning silver. Let me shake it harder. Okay, let's bring this one up nice and close. Yeah, that one's showing up really good. This one's showing up well? Yeah. Okay, yeah, so... Really you see the silver completely coating the bottom. It's got a nice silver mirror, it's reflecting the light completely, even the sides are showing silver. So, what is our conclusion about glucose? Is it an aldehyde or is it a ketone? Aldohexose. Aldohexose. <laughs> I'm going to redo acetone right now. You want another test tube? Yeah. Okay. Acetone is doing a side reaction, which is one of the possibilities. Um, under basic conditions, acetone can make an enolate, which can cause a reaction with the Tollens test. So I'm going to do it slightly backwards. So we're only reducing sugars positive to this test? That's not always true. But, um,. the same result. We're getting too much enolate here. Let me remake the tolerance. This is uh, acetone? This is acetone with the new silver nitrate solution. We're just going to see... There we go. Shake it up. And that's what it's supposed to look you are starting getting a slight discoloration, but we had an issue with the first silver nitrate solution. So we'll go down these again. This is acetaldehyde, a lovely aldehyde. This is acetone, which is a ketone, benzaldehyde, and a lovely shiny silver test tube. That was glucose. Okay, for the next part here, we're going to take a look at some carboxylic acid solubility. Uh, remember that we still have the same uh, general rules about the fact that if you have too many carbons per OH group, they tend to be insoluble. However, we can take advantage of some chemistry here to make things uh, soluble when you wouldn't expect them to be. So uh, this semester you should have uh, covered uh, acid-base reactions where you have an acid reacting with the base, giving you the conjugate base and the conjugate acid. Turns out the same uh, kind of chemistry happens in organic chemistry. Uh, the main difference here is that we are showing uh, the actual arrow pushes here, which is showing electron motion. Don't worry about that now. You'll cover it in full detail in 241. Um, <clears throat> the main takeaway here, though, that I want to show you is that uh, suppose here we, we had a many carbon uh, chain rather than one carbon, uh, making it insoluble. Uh, it turns out that if this is the insoluble acid. You can make it soluble by ionizing it, by reacting it with the base to get the conjugate base here, which is ionic, uh, ionic compound. Uh, additionally, uh, we, we, we could make this compound insoluble again by doing the opposite reaction, by taking the conjugate base, reacting with an acid, would then go back to the protonated form, the, the neutral acid. So in this uh, part of the experiment, we're going to be taking a, a couple of different acids and then throwing them in hydroxide and see what happens. Our next test we're going to do is uh, carboxylic acids. Carboxylic acids, in general, have various um, pKa's. So what we're going to do first is actually just test the acids in water, try to get an approximate idea of how soluble they are. And then we're going to get a more specific idea when we do a pH test of the water. You can talk about how soluble they are based on the pK calculations. Okay, so our first acid we're up for is glacial acetic acid. We are going to, actually this one we'll just add by drops. 
we have very strong vinegar here. I just took a whiff of it. We're looking to see if it makes two layers. And you see two layers. This is one thing that's nice about vinegar. Everybody loves vinegar because it mixes with anything you make in water. Um, and those of you that love oil and vinegar, that's that. So we dissolved some uh, acetic acid in the vinegar. Let's now do a pH test. We're going to use these dipping sticks. And then we're going to compare. So first thing is to get the liquid completely over all four. There we go. Look at the colors carefully. And do a side by side. Uh, a bit of glare. Okay, I'm going to switch hands so I can show it to you guys better. Okay, so we're trying to match colors. And if you ask my opinion, it looks like it's somewhere either a one or a two. And if you want to go halfway in between, it'd be a one and a half, but it looks pretty close to a two. So that's the solubility and the pH of our vinegar. Everybody good with that? Okay, so I'm going to just leave that one there. Now, the other two acids we're testing are actually solids. So dissolving solids has the same challenge we had said before about phenol. We want to see if any of the crystals dissolve. Um, capric acid is actually named for the goat smell. It's too bad you can't smell this because it reminds me of my farm days. Uh, I used to milk goats every morning and every evening. So I'm going to take a small sample. I know this is going to exceed the solubility, but I want to see if I can get any of it to dissolve. And based on how much dissolves, we're then going to do a pH test. So you'll see there's still crystals floating around inside. I don't know if you can see that with probably the dark is better. Yeah. Everybody see the crystals floating around. So we'll just shake it for about 30 seconds, dissolve as much as possible. Capric acid has way too many carbons to dissolve completely. Okay, so let's see what the pH comes out on capric acid. I accidentally dropped the whole paper in there. Thank you. We're going to pull this paper back out now that we had a chance for it to react in the solution. And we're going to compare the pH now of the capric acid. Uh, switching hands. Okay, where does this one land? Hmm. Got the glare? Can you see it? Yep. Okay, it looks like, if you have my opinion, somewhere between five and six. So everybody see that second one is starting to turn kind of greenish. So um, your estimate's as good as mine. Make an estimate in your notebook. So we've done the pH of that one. Okay, benzoic acid is a similar issue with capric acid in that it's a solid and it does not dissolve completely. So we're going to try to saturate it and then see what the pH is to give us an estimation of how much actually dissolved. Okay, so same issue. See the solids floating around? We'll shake it for 30 seconds. Okay, then we're going to run the pH test of this one. This time I'll try not to let go. I have my tweezers just in case I accidentally let go again. Okay, I got all of them nice and colored. And now we want to do this comparison again. All right. So, again, can you see the colors? Yes. All right. It looks like we're sitting it's between a three there. and a four. Yeah, the three is on your left and the four is on the right. It's definitely a little darker than four, but I don't know if it's as dark as a three. Okay. So you noticed we had three different carboxylic gases, but they had slightly different pHs actually very different pHs because they have a different amount of solubility. 
um, and you do the comparison. Now we're going to take these test tubes, put them back here in our rack, and we're going to see what happens to the solubility only when we add sodium hydroxide. The pH will no longer matter because we're adding so much sodium hydroxide, it's going to be pH about 10 to 14. Okay, so we're going to do this slightly in reverse. And we're just going to be looking for solubility. So this is sodium hydroxide. We'll put the sodium hydroxide into all three of them. And now we're going to test first with vinegar. See we, how it happens. We squirt the vinegar in really fast. Made a nice, added a centimeter. And one of the things I cannot convey is the test tube became really warm. Uh, it's actually nice and warm. But, that's just to give you a hint of what's going on. The stay, it remained completely soluble. All right, I'm gonna skip capric acid for a second. I'm gonna come back to it, because I like what it does. We're gonna talk about that one last. We're gonna take some benzoic acid now, add it to the sodium hydroxide, shake vigorously. And we want to see how much of this we can dissolve. And can you see that? Yeah, the solid is starting to disappear. And that's pretty typical when you create an acid base reaction, let's see if it's getting warm. I don't feel the heat like I did with the vinegar. But our solid is definitely dissolving away. Okay. So, the crystals are getting smaller and smaller. So one of the things that you, we should note about carboxylic acids is if they do react with sodium hydroxide, they make a carbonate anion, uh, in this case sodium benzoate, and ionic compounds tend to be much more soluble in water than, than molecular compounds, and I don't see any solid anymore. We have a complete solubility. Okay, our last one is capric acid. Now capric acid has a long organic chain with the very end of which is a carboxylic acid. The organic part can't do anything with the sodium hydroxide, but the end of the chain can. Now this one I'm going to shake a little differently. Can we see that? Now let's shake it up really hard and you should notice that a bunch of bubbles have been made. And we'll keep shaking it until you see them. But what we are actually making is we're making natural soap. Uh, soap was made in ancient days by taking sodium hydroxide and reacting it with fatty acids or fat molecules. And the resulting acid salts actually is what makes soap. So this stuff is the basis of what used to be called lye soap fatty acid mixed with sodium hydroxide. And you'll see that we're making lovely soap bottles. Uh, in ancient days you would collect it all and compress it and make a nice little bar of soap out of what was left of the fatty acid. Okay, for the last part of the experiment we're going to be taking, uh, uh, preparing some esters by reacting with the carboxylic acid in an alcohol. It turns out that esters are a derivative of a carboxylic acid, uh, meaning they come from them. Uh, but I want to specifically point out here that if you have a carboxylic acid, and then instead of the H on the end here, you have another carbon group, that is an ester. <clears throat> so let's go ahead and take a look here at uh, what kind of reaction is happening. Uh, so in this particular uh, reaction mechanism here, uh, showing this acid, uh, that would be our sulfuric acid that we're using in our experiment. Uh, you start off with a protonation step. Uh, the reason why we do the protonation step is that it makes this compound a better electrophile, um, where we have the nucleophilic attack from the alcohol. Uh, this reaction does not happen as readily if it's not protonated first. 
Uh, we then get a tetrahedral intermediate followed by a intermolecular proton transfer, basically transporting an H from one part of the molecule to the other, uh, which gives way to the elimination of water step. Bringing us back here, we have our carbonyl back, and then we deprotonate to get our final ester. Uh, as you'll see uh, in the lab footage here, uh, depending on what groups you have, like what acid you used and what alcohol you used, you get different odors, different esters, and it turns out a lot of fruit smells out there are actually ester compounds. So we're going to see in the footage here that we're going to be uh, getting a couple different wonderful smells. Uh, the one in the procedure, I believe, with isoamyl uh, acetate with what you're making, which is banana oil. Makes the whole laugh smell like bananas. Kind of awesome. <laughs> All right, let's go ahead and take a look. Now, what's fun about these esters here is that we can change these R groups. And as we change these R groups, we'll change what scent or what flavor we're making. So when you have artificially flavored uh, candies or confections, um, they're just playing with these esters. Now, we have a chart over here, which we'll show you. You can find this chart online, just put ester chart. So what's happening here is along here, these are the different alcohols that we can use, starting from carbon one, two, three, as we go up and change the, the uh, alcohol portion. And this is going down changing the acid portion. So there's a whole variety of these different acids changing what we have marked up on that ester as the R group, and this would be the R prime alcohol group. So what we're gonna focus in on today is we have the two carbon unit here. That's the acetic acid part. So we're gonna use N-propyl alcohol and we're gonna try and make the flavor of pears. We're gonna take pentyl alcohol, which is isopentyl alcohol, and we're gonna make banana flavor. We're gonna take octanol, that's an eight carbon alcohol, and we're gonna get the flavor of orange. And then not shown here is benzyl alcohol, which should give us a peach flavor. Now, if you look around this chart, you see like banana shows up here and here. So there's a lot of different uh, compounds that go to the full banana flavor, but this is one of the main components. You see how apple has a few different characteristics of it. You see this is mint. Mint has a bunch of them. Uh, this right here is a bunch of like whiskeys and things like that, these flavors. You can see how pineapple has a lot of these different ratios of these different esters to give you the full flavor of it. Um, so, like I said, we're gonna, we're gonna shoot for pear, banana, orange, and peach is gonna be the benzyl alcohol. So we're gonna try and make four esters, four flavors. I'm sorry we haven't developed smell-o-vision yet, but you can you know, eat some fruit while you're watching this, and we'll show you the procedure for doing it. Hopefully next semester we'll be live and you'll actually be able to make these and we can do the smell tests and maybe we'll do a blind smell test eventually when we get everybody in the lab and we can see if we can pick off these different flavors. Okay, so let's go do some chemistry and make some esters. Okay, so we're gonna set it up. These are our alcohols that we're gonna use here. So here's our one propyl alcohol. It's a three carbon alcohol. This is our ice, it's a five carbon alcohol. It's like a four to chain and then there's an extra methyl group on the end of it. This is octo, so you got octopus, octa. So there's an eight carbon alcohol, it's a one, so the, alcohol, the functionality is on the first carbon, which is where the alcohol is. And this is benzyl alcohol. So this is an aromatic benzene ring. It's got one carbon off the benzene ring that has the alcohol on it. So these are our three alcohols. And then here's our acetic anhydride. So this is going to be uh, an ethyl group on one side, and then we'll have these other R groups on the other side to make those four flavors that we're trying to do. So the first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna take the anhydride, the uh, acetic anhydride. These are all labeled, so this will be the isopropyl, uh, this will be the isoamyl or pentyl alcohol, this will be the octanol, and this will be the benzyl for those keeping track at home. So the, we're gonna use two mils of each of the alcohols and we're gonna use the acetic acid in various amounts. And this is gonna be, uh, the limiting reagent is gonna be the alcohol. So we'll have some of this left over, which we're just gonna react with water and turn it into acetic acid. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're just gonna add, this is our acetic acid. 
with varying amounts. I think it was 2.2, 3.2 maybe. I think this is a 1.5 mils. And this is a 2.3 mils. And you know, being organic chemistry, we don't have to measure these out super, super well. So I'm just using these graduated cylinders. So we need to catalyze this reaction. So we're going to use concentrated sulfuric acid. Our procedure says to use three drops each. So I'm going to put these in here. And we're going to put in three drops. One, two, three. Uno, dos, tres. Three, two, three. Okay. And this is sulfuric concentrated, so you really want to be careful with that. So I'm going to put it capped up, put it way in the bag, get that out of the way, so we don't spill that. Okay. So this is an exothermic reaction. So we have all these labeled. I'm going to put them into an ice bath here. I'll let them cool a little bit. Now it says to add in the alcohols incrementally. And the reason we're doing that is it's an exothermic reaction and we don't want these to get out of control, get too hot, start bubbling and spouting, spouting all over the place. So let's see exactly how exothermic this is. So this is a one. So this is our opal alcohol. And here it is measured off two mils of that. So I'm going to just start putting in incremental amounts of this. And uh, we'll try a few drops of that. Um, I'm not seeing anything too vigorous happening. I'm going to stir it. I'm going to feel it. I don't feel a huge exothermic reaction. So, all precautions aside, that was a, over half of it. There it goes. There it goes. Now I feel it getting warm. Wow. Yeah. There you go. Well, that was an exothermic reaction. So I'll put that back in the water. <laughs> okay. And it took a little bit of mixing to get there. Okay, well that's going, we might as well, this is uh, test tube two, so I'm going to be a little more incremental about this, I think. So here it is, I'm going to just put in less than I put in last time. Okay, so we got that going in, so this is, keep track of this, this is one, I can see a little bit more to add in, this is two. I'm going to put that back in, I'm just going to take my time doing this, because we saw how, and I don't want to put my hand up there in case it does go, and um, that went in a flash, because once it starts heating up, then that encourages the reaction. I don't want these pointed at me. Okay, so let's go for a little bit of free the octanol. I'm going to incrementally add a little bit of this. All right, there's three. We'll let that react. I'm feeling this one. I don't feel it too exothermic yet. And then we'll start incrementally in four, which is our benzyl alcohol. And these are two mils each of the out. What is it? A bit. Okay. And again, look, I'm pointing this into the hood. So this is going to go spurting into the hood. It'll make a mess, but it won't attack anybody. And I can feel this getting warm. It's exothermic. We'll throw that back in here. One has had a time to react a little bit. It's cooled off now. I've got just a little bit left of that, so I'm going to put in the last increment of that. Okay, so now that's all been added in. We're going to let these react a little bit at room temperature. We've got a hot bath going on over here, so we're going to heat these up to get them to go to completion. But we just don't want to do that all at once. So there's a little bit more too. i got a little bit more to add. Incrementally, just take your time. I've got three here, so this is my octanol. I'll put some more of that in there. There's still a little bit more to add, as it says, incrementally, so we're putting that in. Four, we got some more benzyl alcohol. These, these are all pretty cool, so that's a good sign. That first reaction really warmed up. I put a lot in that time, we'll find out. I feel it's warm now again. So that's a good indication we're getting reactions or exothermic reactions. Keep it in there. So let me see. We have all of one is added in. All of one, done. Okay, number two, go back to there, incrementally add in the last of this. 
All right, that's in. I'm pointing this away from me just in case it wants to go out of control. I don't feel it getting too warm. Okay, and it's important that, you know, we're not mixing and matching because we don't want to have peach and orange mixed together. So I feel that's getting warm. I'll put it back in the pebble bath here. Um, the octanol is three. Here's three. All right, and I got about a half a mil, so we'll just add the rest of that in. It's a little bit warm here. Okay, so that's all added in for three. That's all added in. The last of our, of our benzyl alcohol for four. This is cooled off. We're going to add that in. Okay, so now the reaction's gone mostly, but we want to drive it all the way to completion. I feel that, yeah, I feel that's getting, it's warm. So all these are exothermic reactions. So it says in the procedure, just kind of let these react for a little bit. And now, yeah, I can feel that benzyl alcohol still warm. These others are cool. I believe the procedure says just drop in the water now. And it heat it for five minutes. Okay, so we're going to... 70 degrees, so we have a thermometer on it. So I'm going to drop these in. We can heat it up as we go. And again, I'm going to point these towards the back of the hood. So if anything's happening, it's pointing away from this. Safety first. And uh, so it's approaching 160. So I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to turn this up just a little bit. Let it do its thing. Okay. So, the byproduct, in addition to the ester that we're going to make here, byproduct is also going to have um, acetic acid, is the other, and that's very pungent. So, once these are done, we're going to react the rest of the acetic anhydride, the excess amount, to make acetic acid, which is water soluble, and we're going to wash these out. This is an or organic product, so it shouldn't mix with the uh, water. So we'll get the uh, organic compounds that are non-halogenated are usually less dense. So we expect it to be on the upper layer when we put in the water, and the bottom layer will have uh, the water extracting out that acetic acid. So when we go to smell these things eventually, we won't be overwhelmed with that acetic acid smell, and we'll hopefully just smell the ester. So once we get these up to temp, I'm gonna crank this up a little bit more. We don't see anything going out of control, so that's good. And we're just finishing off these. So again, this is number one for isopropanol, isopentyl alcohol, octanol, benzyl alcohol. So according to legend, this is going to be pear, banana, orange, and peach. And we'll have to confirm that. Okay, so we're all right. So we're back. So we have now heated these up. That this water bath did get up to 70 degrees. It's been five minutes. So that just drove the reaction to completion. So now we're going to cool these. I've just got a little bit of ice in here, and we're going to cool these down. And then what we're going to do is we're going to extract. There's some. There's still some acetic and hydride left. So we're going to put a little bit of water in here to hydrolyze the last of the acetic acid. Um, I mean, acetic anhydride to acetic acid, and then we're going to wash it with a sodium chloride saturated salt solution. It's going to be half saturated, so we're going to dilute this with 50-50 with water. We're going to do extraction with this first. We're going to do an extraction of sodium bicarb. This will neutralize any acid that's in there. Then we're going to do another wash with half uh, saturated sodium chloride. So we'll just put in three mils of this, three mils of water, and then we'll do a final fourth rinse with just pure saturated sodium chloride. This extra salt content being saturated, it'll help draw out water from the organic layer, which is basically our ester at that point. Okay, so these are cooled off. It's said to add eight drops. Yes, eight drops. Eight drops of water. And this is just to take that acetic anhydride and we're going to hydrolyze it to acetic acid. So, so now it says to make six mils of half saturated sodium chloride. So what we're going to do for this is we're going to add three mils of this and then three mils of pure water to each.
All right, so this is just a, a, you know, it's a glass pipette, and we put this pipette bulb on the top. So now I can get down to the bottom where that bottom layer is, the water. And so I'm going to just start sucking up that water. Okay, I'm going to do the smell test and see what happens. Now when you do this, I wouldn't put your nose right in there. You want to kind of waft it towards yourself. It smells like soap. Do you smell orange? A little bit. Yeah. So when you're smelling this, you got to remember on that table of esters, orange shows up a lot of, so there's a combination of several esters that go into the overall orange flavor, uh, smell. But that's pretty close, so we'll put that over here as number three. Okay, so this is number one. This is supposed to smell like pear. I still smell a lot of acetic acid, but I've got a hint of pear in there for myself. So we can smell the pear in there. Here, aha! Look at this. This is this is a mess. Remember, the water is supposed to be up here, and that's supposed to be prodded. So this is an emulsion in here. We might have to do an extra rinse on this. Oh, there it is. So now I'm going to do the, the smell test here. Yeah, you kind of got to imagine peach. It almost smells like bananas. The worst is it? Yeah, and you know, who knows? The banana oil might have a little bit of that in it. Okay, so I'm going to give. You're not watching, right, Barbara? Okay, so I'm going to give him. I'm going to give him one of these. And so it's going to be either pear, banana, orange, or peach. Okay, Mark. What do you think? Which one is it? I think it's orange. He's got, he, he got it. He nailed the orange. Okay. Well, now he's got one out of three to get it right. Okay, you're not looking, right? You're not looking. We all know what this. Be quiet, people. Don't give him, don't give him a hint. There he goes. Oh, that's the banana. Yeah, the banana oil is, yep, 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 yep. And it smells like real ripe bananas. So now he's got a 50-50 shot. Or I could, I could redo one of those. Sneaky. All right, so let's see. Let's. These two are going to be the more difficult ones. You got the peach. No, 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 no. That's supposed to be the pear. Oh, it's the pear. And this would be the peach. Yeah, there. You know, you got to use a little imagination. Please. Yeah, I, I, I th and when you get them back to back, they're very similar. Yeah, they're very similar. Okay. But that's how you make esters. Here's our artificial flavors. You can go make some. Um, this is a, what was a circus peanuts. This is the artificial flavor of banana and circus peanuts. Well, I hope you enjoyed this, and uh, we are looking forward to uh, doing this live in the lab eventually again so we can have people actually smell these compounds. So that's how esters are produced and where they come from in nature and why you have these nice fruity flavors with these esters. Okay, so take care, everybody.